when you have inexorable faith in something, you have to follow it through. You have to follow your heart. How I got involved with Hunter Prey and Simon and Darren and Sandy and everyone is, I played the Batman in Sandy's film, Batman Dead End. I met Sandy through Simon and Darren uh, back when we did Batman Dead End and I've uh, just been part of the crew that's aimlessly followed Sandy since then. Uh, <laughs> Batman Dead End in 2003 was the highlight of Comic-Con San Diego and became one of the most downloaded short films in internet history. That gave us a fan base that was very anxious to see something that Sandy would be able to put on a feature level. The idea came to me uh, via my co-writer, uh, Nick Damon, who him and I have been talking uh, for years about how to make a low-budget movie that would be interesting and still incorporate all the things that we like, the monsters and the spaceships and the specialty costumes and that kind of thing. The characters in Hunter Prey started as sketches like, like so many things do. I tend to get involved very early visually with doing sketches, renderings, and, and maquettes about uh, what these characters look like and, and, and what their physicality is. Sandy had a definite vision of what he wanted to see with the, uh, the makeup, the prosthetics, the costuming, the props. It took an awful lot to put that together. Some of it was done in New York, some of it was done in L.A. You know, a lot of shows say we have no money, but this show didn't have any money. Um, so, we, you know, we did a lot of stuff in, in our spare time and, and traveled back and forth between each other's uh, uh, houses and, and uh, put stuff together and found stuff on the side of the road and incorporated it. Sandy gave me plenty of pre-production time on this film. Uh, he gave me, I think, six months lead, which is not what I'm used to. He had all the designs done for the makeups. He told me basically what was involved. I read the script. He broke everything down for me, so it was very, very simple process for me, given the time I had. Uh, he didn't have a whole lot of money, but time was in our favor, so that helped out a lot. This is one of our soldiers. The armor was done by, by Scott Page back in New York and his guys. Um, the undersuits we did here and uh, all the accessories, uh, the belts and boots and gloves and stuff like that. And then this is our director, uh, Sandy's character, Masakwa. This is something that, that I threw together. Uh, Sandy and I came up with it. Actually, there's pieces of it from... Uh, other things that we've done in the past um, that we thought would look good. It was so exciting every day to go to either Chris's studio or get boxes from Scott Page in New York when he would send me the props and send me armor. Because we would work over the computer. Everything was through email and pictures and phone calls. Of uh, He was sculpting and making all that stuff in New York. And... It was just so much fun to get these big boxes full of guns and props and Clea and the armor and the helmets. And right away I'd get them and I'd run outside in the parking lot and start kicking them around and throwing paint on them and burning them. And it was just so much fun. I mean, I, I was so tactily involved in, in, in this picture that, that uh, you know, my little fingerprints, I guess, are all over it. I think before I met Sandy, I saw Simon and Darren, who I know for 20 years. And um, they were telling me about this movie and that they were going to do, and Simon asked me if I was available. Then I met Sandy, and, you know, we hit it off immediately. Regarding the red camera, uh, admittedly, I was a bit skeptical. Um, I had not shot anything but 35-millimeter film. Realistically, that was not in the cards. And Simon and Darren sat me down and said, look, we have one of these cameras. We can get some people involved that also have cameras that are excited to work with you. We strongly suggest that you give it a whirl. Being the, the people that they are, Simon and Darren, I, I took that to heart, and I started to become very intimate with the camera. I had several discussions with Ed about, about how we could make the thing look as cinematic as possible. 
no matter what format you shoot on, whether it be film or digital or whatever it is, you should always use the best lenses. If you use a $5 lens on a camera and you blow it up on a movie screen, it's really not going to look very good. If you use a $75,000 lens, there's a reason that it's $75,000. So we used these amazing lenses. We used Ingenue Optimo lenses. The thing that was daunting about the RED camera and shooting on digitally was, was basically the same thing that, <laughs> to tell you the truth, that it was, it's, it's, it's odd because it was the same thing that I loved about it, which was the level of detail. It is just, I mean, those makeup guys had to be on point because, like I said, I'm here, here, you know, here on a, on a prosthetic. You know, that's, that's not, you know, that's crazy talk, you know, when you're talking about a prosthetic. So those guys really did a great job. They, uh, between them and, and the CG guys contributing um, some of their uh, incredible magic, we were really able to pull off some of those extreme close-ups and so forth. Whatever we could do in camera, we did. Because that was one of the things Sandy and I talked about during prep. It was like, it's so much better to do it in camera. And especially on this budget, you know, they couldn't afford, you know, oh, well, we'll just, you know, we'll make that in the computers. Like, that wasn't going to happen. Sandy and I have been friends for a while before he started putting the movie, when he was putting the movie together. And he thought of me for the role because he knew I was heavily involved in stunts. And so, seeing as how it was a very active and a uh, very arduous role to play. He knew that he needed somebody who could handle the, the rough and tumble of it. We all die. That's your solution. How can you be so naive? Another faction will rise up in our place. An endless cycle. The only way to break it is to take control from those in power, to rule in their stead. The original conception of the character for Centauri 7 was this very tough, gritty Clint Eastwood type of a guy and through working through the performance with Damien he, he, he brought an intelligence to it and a likability that that Nick and I certainly didn't see in the original script and that's one of the wonderful things about a movie and, and from a filmmaker's perspective is discovering the movie and the characters along the way of, of actually making the film. This thing is the last of its kind. We destroyed this home world, but somehow it's figured out a way to return the favor. So if we don't catch a damn thing and get it back to base, we may not have a world to go home to. A friend of mine named Damien, who happens to be one of my co-stars in this film, came up to me and we were talking. He's kind of froze for a second. He says, oh my God, I, I, why didn't I think of this? I'm like, think of what? He ran off in the corner and made a phone call. And came back and said, hey, uh, we're getting ready to do this movie, and you'd be great for it. I want you to meet the director. His name is Sandy. And I said, okay. Can I give him your phone number? I said, sure. You give him your phone number if you want to. So Sandy called me up, and we went and met at a diner, sat down, talked about the movie. And I said, sure. I'd be more than happy to do it. Sandy actually called me up one day, and he, you know, I asked him, I said, what are you doing? He goes, well, I'm working on a movie. And I said, Okay. Uh, were you planning on calling me? And he's like, oh my gosh, you know, I didn't even think about you. I'm like, are you serious right now? I'm Batman. I mean, how could you not think about me when you had this humongous success with Batman Dead End? I mean, six years later, I still get emails from people that I forward to Sandy of them saying how much they love this little eight-minute movie that he did with me in it as the Batman. And he forgot about me for this thing. So I'm thinking, okay, how can I weasel my way into this movie? How did I not think of this to begin with? I mean, he's my guy, you know? And to bear my soul and, and be as honest as I can be, I felt bad. I felt really bad because I, I didn't think of it originally. It started off as me playing an alien in the movie who you would never know that it was me, and it turned into something much bigger than that. So when I took the idea to Simon and Darren, they were unsure. They love Clark as, a, as an individual. He did a great job on all the other stuff we've worked on with him. But justifiably so, they were not convinced that he could carry this movie. 
When I was preparing for the role of Orrin Jericho, my inspiration really honestly came from Sandy because he believed in me. That was the big thing. And, and there's no secret about it. There were people that didn't think, myself included, after having accepted the role that I could really pull it off. Because when I started to think that people had their life savings tied up into this and, and they put their heart and their blood, sweat and tears into all of this, and I'm thinking, wow, if I don't pull this off, People's lives are on the line, literally. A couple of days into shooting his stuff, one of the more personally uh, gratifying moments for me was it was a quiet moment. We had done shooting for the day, and I was on the side of the trailer, and Simon came over, and uh, he had this big smile on his face. And he put his arm around me, and I looked at him. And, you know, we're tired, we're dirty, grimy, you know. And, and here's this guy that has, that has taken on this huge, almost insurmountable project with this big smile on his face. And uh, he looked at me and he goes, you were right about Clark. He's, he's, he's fantastic. You're a bounty hunter. Ah! That is such an ugly word. Soldier of fortune, more like it. The bounty hunter. Um, originally, in the original script, there were two bounty hunters. I was going to play the, the sidekick character. Two weeks before we were leaving for Mexico, this, this, the, the prosthetic was very far along and so forth, the actor called me and said that he was ineligible for a U.S. passport. I decided that rather than recasting the character, I sat down with Nick and I said, what do you think about making this work with one bounty hunter? The other cast members in the crew were so supportive that day. Uh, they were the whole shoot, really, but uh, just on that day in particular, everybody was very encouraging and supportive, and, and they helped me through it. The hard part was, was directing. While you got these scleral lenses in, and I can't see... And it's, you're, you're in this prosthetic makeup, and you've got a 60-pound costume on. It's 110 degrees. And um, that, that, honestly, that was the harder part. I, I, I torture Clark that way because he lets me. Uh, <laughs> I called him up and I said, hey, look, you know, come, come, come down. I want to I show you something. I want to talk to you about something. He says, okay. So he shows up and I had the mask and I said, uh, I need you to swallow this. He's like, okay, I tried it myself because he won't ask you to do anything unless he tries it for himself first. I mean, he'll jump off the buildings. He'll do everything that he wants you to do. Partly because he's a nut like that, he's just like me, he loves the physical part. And secondly, he wants to prove that it can be done. So he's like, listen, I swallowed this thing and you can do it. It just takes time and you got to work on your gag reflex. So if I send you home with this, do you think you can get it done by the time we get down to Mexico? And I thought, okay, what the heck, I'll, you know, I'll give it a try. He's like, if you start with fishing line, it's a lot easier, you know, it's smaller and you can work your way up to this, you know, cable. And it, what it is, is it's all these filaments and fibers and rubber tubing with little... Uh, acrylic balls on it and so forth and and what it what it's meant to be in the world of the film is 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 the breathing and feeding apparatus of this containment mask that he's in and I wanted to do it in one shot from this angle from the front but I had swallowed those things and the first time I did I thought the scene was great but something happened it was over modulated or whatever and Sandy comes up and is you know special delivery that only he can do. He's like, Clark, listen, I'm not talking about that. It's like, you think you can do that again? I'm like, oh my gosh, man, I gotta swallow those things again? So I'm sitting there, you got, you know, 18 people around you, and I'm like... He, he, he defined that moment in the movie. I mean, when people see that, they're, they're just like... Because there's, there's, there's no way to cheat that. It, it is what it is. The summer before we shot Hunter Prey, I had gone to Gonzaga Bay uh, on a spear fishing and diving fishing trip. 
and I started looking at all of this incredible landscape and how beautiful it all was and the fact that it, it was very unique. I'd never seen anything quite like it. We had to find a way to make this work. So I talked to Dale Pearson about it, who was the guy that I was on the fishing trip with, and put him in touch with Simon and Darren, and collectively they all figured out how to make it work. Um, and I was very thankful for that because I think the locations and the terrain actually becomes a character in the film. When we decided to go to Mexico because we had the accommodations there and the locations were there, our cast is their SAG members. And this was just at the time of the pending SAG strike. I was told that we couldn't take an ultra low budget film to out of the country and which created a problem because we had all we were ready to go to uh, Mexico so a good friend of ours Julie Caitlin Brown went before the board with a letter that Simon and she composed stating the reasons why we wanted to take it out of the country uh, and we were granted the first ever waiver to take an ultra low budget project out of the country I was supposed to be staying at this luxurious resort down in Mexico where we were going to fly down. There was going to be women fondling over me all the time, feeding me grapes when I was on set. Uh, that didn't necessarily happen that way. We had to be able to do this movie with, I think it was 17 or 18 people because that's, you know, the size of the movie was dictated by who could stay in the house, basically. It's funny because we, we were in a very, very isolated area. We had very limited resources when it comes to being able to use the phone. The house was solar powered. Water was in a tank. You know, we had to bring in all of our water and things like that. And it was, it, it, for, for the film, for the production, it was kind of nice because the whole production was about being in this desolate wasteland and not being able to get to the resources that you were normally accustomed to. The whale skeletons are 100% real. They are there on the beach in Portocitos, uh, God knows how long they've been there, and they were magnificent. They were absolutely magnificent. I, as a matter of fact, I, I could have spent way more time shooting in those skeletons, but again, you know, you have to tell a story. You don't want to draw the audience's eye to it. You want it to be part of the mythos of this world and of the film. The location that we used was very sunny, very hot, very dry. And it was really sunny. It was hot, very dry. Sunny, really hot. And like always dry. Like I said, we drank so much water. And really dry. Dry. Hot. I knew it was going to be hot. I got myself prepared as much as I took as, as Everything down there that I thought I was going to need, you know, it's all, in my opinion, going into battle like that, you, it's always best to have more than what you, what you need than turn up down there and go, oh, man, you know, I wish I brought this, I wish I brought that. Darren was not in Mexico. She had almost as hard of a time with this as we did. She was on the receiving end of the sat phone that was constantly <laughs> ringing with questions, demands, we ran out of this, we ran out of that. When Sandy offered me the role and I said I accepted it, I realized that there was going to be, you know, makeup. I think it was 14 or 15 makeup days where I would be in a complete head covering piece. And it was, it was a hood and then a face piece with no nose. So I had to breathe out of my mouth. You know, I had like holes in my ears and my skin was just completely covered and I had to shave every, almost every day to keep, you know, so that I wouldn't be pulling hair out when I put the makeup on. I remember, yeah, we'd get up four in the morning, no light. I think there was one little spotlight. <laughs> we were on little chairs starting this makeup process. It took about two, two and a half hours, gluing the pieces on, basically waiting for the sun to come up over the water <laughs> to light up our workspace to start painting these makeups that were going to be in the sunlight, shot close up, high definition, all day long. I think the biggest challenge was just definitely just working with um, all the prosthetics on the face. Um, you know, I had a hard time with the mask myself. You couldn't see so much what you're doing, so you just had to rely on your movements, and it was like doing a fight with your eyes shut. 
You make a movie three times. You know, you, you make a movie when you write it, then you, you remake it when you shoot it, and then you re-remake it when you edit it. All of the three for me on this were challenging, interesting, uh, and long. Uh, Post in particular because the CG elements, the miniature effects shots, um, were all done with a very small crew, particularly the CG. That was done by a, a very big Clio award-winning uh, effects house in New York called Semerod. And they were, they, they were instrumental in, in bringing all the CG stuff to life. We had a mutual friend, uh, Stephen Block, who uh, was working with Sandy on some stuff. So he got Sandy and me together. Sandy called me and said, you know, I'm going in on a full length, you know. And I was like, okay. And because, you know, shorts, there's not much avenues to, to show them, but a full length I, I was really interested in. And he said, I've sold all my comics to fund this. And I was like, that's when he had me. You know, I was like, I got to get in. So he goes, I'm going to need like eight to ten visor shots and that's about it. And I think we ended up doing like uh, 160 shots all together. The ship sequence is, is, a, is a miniature shoot. That ship uh, was built. It, it, it's about six or seven feet long. Sandy gave me storyboards and drawings which depicted how he wanted to see the doors open in the dunes to a hangar below ground. I was able to create a set of doors which would uh, roll across the top of a dumpster and create this hangar. It had a few, you know, blowers that we blew sand around with and shot at a really high speed, low angle, wide lens. We had equipment on site which we were able to use for a very high rigging point which afforded us the ability to lift the spaceship up out of the dumpster. The footage that we got was scrubbed of wire and equipment by Semerad in New York and when edited by Toby the resulting clips were pretty amazing for a bunch of guys in a dumpster. We're all very proud of it. Before I started working on this project Sandy actually had me watch uh, all these like old school westerns and I was watching these um, these old films and they were like really drawn out long cuts and you know I come from the trailer world where everything is like fast-paced editing you know there's no you know there's no waiting for anything so it's gonna be a, this is sort of a challenge for me to like okay can I just step back and take a breath and let a scene breathe working with Sandy was great you know when he came back with all this footage he gave me you know plenty of time to kind of complete a whole rough cut before he came and looked at and looked at it. This was my first red project. Um, I had heard about it, but I'd never worked with it. So I love technology. So I was like, yeah, I was actually excited to work with the red. Literally, the technology changed so much in the course of uh, the six months or so that we were working on this that it became so much easier. When a composer first comes on a film, oftentimes they hear a temp score, which is a temporary musical score that's been put in by the editor from other movies and it all came from a certain period of time for the most part it came from film music of the 70s and uh, it was actually one of the most brilliant temp scores I've ever heard and uh, it, it uh, was very exciting because I really love that period of time in film music as well the first thing that really got me passionate and interested about the project was Sandy himself and his passion for it which was absolutely undeniable he was so into what everything he was doing that was very apparent from the start. I'd edited the film and I was tired and I was admittedly a little burnt out and when Chris came along and contributed not only that incredible score but contributed himself it was it, it was like somebody shot me up with endorphins you know it, it got me re-energized about the movie. We decided that Really, the first part of the film, the first third, should be pretty primitive and brutal and, and percussive and strange. After the point where Jericho is revealed, the film music begins to blossom and become a bit more traditional and a bit more uh, human, as it were, and warm. There's a lot of truth in Hunter Prey. As a group of filmmakers, we, in essence, were up against the same things that Centauri and Jericho were up against. We had to deal with the heat. 
We had to deal with a time constraint. There was a ticking clock. There were disagreements. There were times of levity, and there were times that were more intense. But in the end, like Jericho and Centauri, the crew all came together as a family and made everything work. One of the reasons I took this job as seriously as I did is because it became more and more apparent how insane it was for these people to make this movie, what they went through. And so every day that I sat there working in my air-conditioned studio, <laughs> looking at these gorgeous images, I kept uh, thanking my lucky stars. I didn't actually have to be out there with them. <laughs> it was truly, it was a labor of love. Everybody's to be thanked. Thank you, 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 thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. No matter what is in front of you, no matter what the obstacles are, you have to follow your heart. This is where performances like Clark's in this film and the film itself come from. They come from love. They come from the heart. This film was a love letter to my childhood and all the films I grew up with and the extraordinary filmmakers that have inspired me. And, and, and hopefully... It's, that's what it's looked upon as, is, is, is an homage to the brilliant films of the 70s and, the, and, and when, when the late 60s, when, when science fiction was in its infancy and, and Stanley Kubrick gave us 2001 and Franklin J. Schaffner and Pierre Boulle gave us Planet of the Apes and George Lucas gave us Star Wars and Ridley Scott gave us Alien and John Carpenter gave us The Thing and... Halloween and Escape from New York and all these wonderful films that were made in that time period. I, there's something about those movies that has been lost in contemporary sci-fi and fantasy movies and I want to try and bring that back. I want to try and bring back that unbridled love and passion for the genre and the truth of, of what those movies should be about.